Science fantasy is an uncommon genre to tackle, mostly because it's hard to get the balance right. In most cases, the balance is skewed one way or the other, where at worst turns to blank fantasy entry in space. Regardless, it's still an interesting challenge since it's the epitome of high concept. Given that, what happens when you mix Evangelion, the good parts, Macross, and Giver into a pot with a bit of HP Lovecraft thrown in? You get a purist's worst nightmare. But you also get Cthulhu tech. Today we are canceling the apocalypse! <laughs> Written by Matthew Grau and Fraser McKay, and published by Wildfire Entertainment, Cthulhu Tech's core rulebook runs at 292 pages. The book is in full color, but the artwork itself is excellent, showing both the future it wants to present, as well as the horrors that a gaming group will be confronted with. Much of the book's layout is very much a student in the storyteller school of RPG books, with several short stories in between chapters, as well as a couple spreads to make it look like in-universe propaganda pieces. The only real problem I have with the layout is the placement of page numbers in the middle end instead of the corner, which makes skimming a bit tricky for me. However, I admit this is a minor nitpick. Chapter 1 is the game's introduction to the world of Cthulhu Tech, and as such, it introduces the main concepts as well as the usual RPG introduction material. Tying into what I said earlier about the book being a graduate of the storyteller system, this chapter has a lot of terms discussed here in its lexicon. There's a segment in the back of the chapter discussing some of the inspirational material a la Exalted, although how anyone could look at M.D. Geist and get inspired is anybody's guess. Chapter 2 details the changed world of Cthulhu Tech and how things got to their current state. The first half consists of a timeline with the events leading to the present day, while the latter half details the factions and organizations in this world. In that timeline, an ancient Germanic treatise called The Mysteries Within prompts a newfound study in non-Euclidean geometry, resulting in a new inexhaustible source of power called the Dimensional Engine, or D-Engine. Shortly after the breakthrough of this discovery, Earth finds itself under attack by the Migo, an alien race from Pluto who feel threatened by humanity's rapid development. The Migos' first attack was through a manufactured race called the Nazadi, who are given a false history as a proud race of warriors before they decide to rebel against their masters, integrating themselves into Earth society under the banner of the New Earth Government. As these events pass, a multitude of cults scheme to bring the gods they serve out of their slumber. The remaining half of the chapter gives details on each of the major factions within the setting, as well as a segment on life in the world as it is. Each of these factions has a rumors sidebar that consists of potential campaign seeds. Throughout parts of this section, allusions are made to the Tager, Engel, and Sorcery, which we'll get into later on. Chapter 3 is called The Art of the Game. This is only a two-page spread that focuses on what a storytelling game entails, both in character and narrative. To its credit, it's a very accessible description of this particular style of play, but I don't see why it couldn't have been combined into the next chapter. Chapter 4 details the game's mechanical system, called Framework. I will give you a moment to giggle at the spelling of it. Much like older storyteller-style games, Cthulhu Tech uses a die pool, this time using d10 die versus a target number. In a similar vein, the die pool is generated from the sum of a given attribute and skill. When it comes to the die result you gain, that's where things are a little different. The results of the die pool can take one of three forms, either A, the highest single die result, B, the sum of any matching die, in other words, two of a kind, three of a kind, four of a kind, etc., or C, the sum of any sequential die result, in other words, a straight. While this adds a Yahtzee-like effect to the die, I do think the game would have benefited from a result's storage ability, similar to the river mechanic in Weapons of the Gods. The remaining parts of the chapter are just fine-tunes of the primary mechanic, Though I should note that any role that doesn't use a skill is called a feat test, which has a pseudo-skill of its own to balance it out. Additionally of note is the game's extra effort mechanic, drama points, which can be used to add die to a roll, or my personal favorite, rob an enemy of dice for a roll. Chapter 5 is the character creation chapter, which is achieved in the following steps. First is the character's concept. Concept consists of allegiance, profession, and race. Allegiance is the faction which they are considered to be a member of, and profession is the trade they're adept in. The specific professions will be covered later on in the book, but there's no mechanical aspect to the concept part. Finally, race merely covers if you are a human or a Nazadi. Step 2 is attributes. You have 35 points to spend across 6 attributes. Each attribute must have a minimum of 1 point and a maximum of 10. However, your choice of race may provide modifiers for the final attribute score. The six attributes listed are Agility, Intellect, Perception, Presence, Strength, and Tenacity. 
Step 3 is Skills, Specializations, and Qualities. Characters have 20 points to spend on skills, which rate from 1 to 5, and specializations, which add 1 or 2 die. However, starting characters cannot have any skill rated above 3, and may only have 2 focuses, gained by spending 1 skill point. That said, there are a set of basic skills that any character is already considered to have before points are spent. Finally, a character is considered to have a feat skill rating equal to half of his associated attribute. Qualities are the game's advantage-disadvantage mechanic that operates on a point-buy system, called assets and drawbacks in this case. Either way, qualities use skill points as a resource, either spending them or giving a bonus to them, respectively. The only restriction is that you cannot gain more than 10 skill points from drawbacks as a means to prevent min-maxing. Personally, I'm not a fan of it drawing from the same pool as skills, but it serves as an effective balance based on player choice, even if it comes close to metagaming at times. Many of the more specialized character archetypes, like the taggers, require a specific asset here. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how much of a tease it is to put in an asset for parapsychics, but not put in the mechanics for such in the core book. I'll get to parapsychics later when I cover the companion book, Vade Meku. Step 4 is to calculate the secondary attributes. Essentially, the game's derived stats based on the six main attribute scores. The secondary attributes are as follows, along with the determining formula. First is actions, which is the average of your ability and perception, and determines how many actions you can take in a turn. Next is movement, which is the average of agility and strength, and this determines both the running speed of your character and the amount of space you can move in a 5 second turn. Orgone is the average of intellect and tenacity plus 5. This is the game equivalent of magic points and is used for sorcery and the use of arcane technologies. Next is reflex, which is the average of agility, intellect, and perception. A player's given reaction speed and how quickly they can react on the turn order is what reflex calculates. Vitality is next, which is the average of strength and tenacity plus 5. This is the character's physical health, separated into 5 levels of wounds from unhurt to death's door, each having a cumulative penalty to your rolls. Finally is drama points, Cthulhu Tech's extra effort mechanic as I've mentioned before. All dramatic characters, including player characters, start with 10 drama points and replenish them at the end of play. Step 5 is about the character's gear. There isn't a set resource pool to spend on gear at character creation, and is usually determined by the character's choice of profession, pending any changes by the GM. The final step is cheats, which are this game's version of bonus points in a lot of White Wolf games. You gain 6 points to spend on cheats, and lose any points that are unspent when finished. Cheats can be used to start with a first order spell, to increase or go under vitality, or increase attributes and skills, even beyond their normal limits. The remaining parts of the chapter cover bringing the character to life, followed by an entry on professions in the two races. At the end of the chapter is a segment on developing the character after creation, namely giving the experience point cost of improving your various stats. Chapter 6 is basically a skills list. There are 49 skills in total, with most of them being general skills, rather than combat skills. Some of the skills in question have an asterisk next to them, which denotes them being professional skills and thus cannot be rolled as an unskilled attempt. In addition, some skills require training in a complementary or related skill in order to have any points in them. Chapter 7 is a list of the game's qualities, the mechanics of which we went over in the character creation segment. Each quality's cost or bonus is noted in parentheses, with a full list of all at the end. Chapter 8 is called The Way of the Future, and is this book's equipment chapter, or as I've often called these chapters, the toy box. The first half of the chapter discusses in detail how the technological innovations of our Tech and D engines have changed the way weapons, medicine, and currency works. However, the entries for the player equipment aren't as strongly described. There's a few charts near the end for weapons, armor, and tools, but I think a greater effort should have been spent on how individual items work in the game's context. Also, it's a bit of shame that weapon customization is so minimized. Chapter 9 is the combat chapter. Much of the combat presented is standard fare, but the fact that attacks are treated as contested rolls is something I like here. In addition, both damage and damage reduction is done through dice. Following that is a summary of the actions available in a given turn for melee and or ranged combat, as well as more specific combat applications like feats, the wound system, and explosives. Mecha combat is detailed midway through, and works like normal combat except for one minor detail. Mecha scale combat uses integrity instead of vitality as its hit point equivalent. This has a 1 to 50 comparative ratio, i.e. 1 point of integrity equals 50 points of vitality. If you're a fan of rifts or the palladium system in general, 
This concept might sound familiar to you, but in my opinion, it's a lot less convoluted, though palladium and convoluted mechanics is kind of an obvious statement. Finally, fear and insanity are detailed at the end of the chapter. In both cases, a tenacity feat roll is used to determine whether a character suffers the effects of either. The primary difference is that fear is a more temporary effect, while insanity is trickier to recover from. Furthermore, there is no threshold on fear, but there is a 10-point threshold for insanity that players get closer to each time they fail the tenacity roll. Chapter 10 details the game's mecha, opening with a collection of charts for sensor systems, miscellaneous support systems, movement systems, and weaponry. Much of the mechanics here work similar to character equipment, but there are added wrinkles like linked weapons, which combine the damage bonuses from two weapons in a single action. The semi-organic Engels have their own mechanic, specifically that they'll enter a berserker state if the f pilot falls unconscious or is killed. The next few pages detail the primary mecha for each of Cthulhu Tech's factions, and an army point system if you wanted to use them like a war game. On an interesting note, mechs don't have attributes of their own, with the exception of strength but instead have their systems provide bonuses to primary and secondary attributes. I like this approach, since it places a bit of emphasis on the pilot's role with the mech, in keeping with the game's anime influences. Each of the mecha and their roles are well detailed, but part of me wishes this book had a mech creation system in it. The end of this chapter details taggers, humans and Nazadi who have bonded with eldritch symbionts to transform into monstrous warriors. Taggers can transform at will, and gain a lesser bonus to some attributes in their human forms. In addition, each Tagger has a powerful ability called the Limit Weapon, which is a full round ability that requires a tenacity feat roll to use, to a limit of once per day. On the other hand, Taggers start with one insanity point from their symbiont, and only half the normal orgone. The exception to this is the Nightmare type symbiont, which takes all of the orgone. In addition, they must succeed an insanity roll each month, otherwise they will gain one point of insanity. Chapter 11 is focused on magic in Cthulhu Tech. Owing to the game's themes, much of the magic is ritualistic in nature, and there are very few spells that could be classified as fire and forget. Additionally, using magic is highly dangerous if not done properly, as shown via the mishaps mechanic if spellcasting suffers a critical failure, the risks of insanity from both casting and learning the spell, and the legality of certain spells or lack thereof. Thankfully, the use of spells is not limited to X per day, but instead utilizing the expenditure of Orgone, called Ruach by spellcasters. The chapter also has a segment on several occult tomes that may aid in the use of magic-based skills, though some run the risk of insanity when read and have questionable legality, as mentioned before. While there are few spells actually in the book, all of them are detailed in their components, rituals, and effects. Chapter 12 is the game's bestiary. Stat-wise, there are a few differences in how entries in this chapter use attributes, abilities, etc. However, some entries have a stat called Fear Factor, which determines the target number that PCs have to overcome on a fear test when first encountering them. Near the end of the chapter, some advice is given to the GM on how to use fear tests properly, as well as to make the creatures in the chapter unique. Chapter 13 covers vehicles. The vehicles included in this chapter range from civilian transportation, to combat vehicles, to massive battleships. For the most part, the vehicle entries function like the entries for Mecha and operate on the integrity scale. The sole exception to this is the battleships at the end of the chapter, which operate on the hull scale. Hull, in this case, operates in the same way as the vitality-integrity ratio, and thus 50 points of integrity equals 1 point of hull. Chapter 14 is called Parting the Veil and is mostly a fluff chapter discussing the cosmology of Cthulhu Tech's world. This includes the major meta-terrestrial races, deities, and dimensions known in H.P. Lovecraft's mythos, thankfully not taking the August Derlethian approach. Chapter 15 is the GM chapter, and offers a great deal of advice on how to structure campaigns based on the themes the game tries to establish, as well as how to balance the anime-cosmic horror spectrum the game has going for it. Like most storyteller-style games, this chapter gives suggestions using a 3x structure, making references to TV shows and films. Chapter 16 is a set of example characters and potential NPCs, each with their own backstories and personalities. The entries have a broad level of experienced and veteran, suggesting that if you wanted to move between the two or go further, add or subtract 20 skill points and 5 attribute points. The final chapter is a sample adventure called Death and Victory, which involves the player characters as crew members of the newly commissioned NES Victory and their journey into enemy territory to retrieve an ancient artifact. 
The adventure goes in three acts and contains a cast of supporting characters, story hooks, and alternative approaches for different styles of play. After the chapter is an index and character sheet, wrapping up the book. Final thoughts. I've seen a lot of cases where people have cried foul about the game for having humans engaged in open combat with the forces beyond the stars. As someone who has read nearly every Lovecraft story there is, I find this ridiculous because it implies there is only one true way to do the Cthulhu mythos. Cthulhu Tech utilizes the mythos in its own way without being slavish to it, a fact that's noted early on in the opening chapter. That aside, this is a game that, despite being over 280 pages long, is very dense in the world that it presents. I couldn't confirm it one way or another, but I would not be surprised if the writers were either fans of World of Darkness or had written for it at some point, as I've hinted at several times in this review. It shares a few similarities mechanically and in its presentation, but it doesn't keep the exact same womb system. Thank God. On the downside, there are a few things that bring the game just shy of greatness. There's a couple of teases to things that will appear in Vade Mecum, a supplement in the school of stuff we couldn't fit into the main book. See also Dark Heresy's The Inquisitor's Handbook. I'm not a fan of that approach, since it comes off like certain DLC fiascos that I won't name here. Finally, it appears that the ability to strike the right tone between the anime and cosmic horror aspects of the game doesn't mesh as well in certain parts. I think seeing some street-level examples of the world would have benefited greatly, as a lot of time is given to the Humans and Nazati versus the Migos story seeds, and not so much for things like the Eldritch Society, or some of the cults like the Rapine Storm, or the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Regardless, Cthulhu Tech is a very unique take on the things man was not meant to know, and a good science fantasy game in its own right. I'll definitely be re-watching some Generator Gaul, some Giver, and maybe a bit of Razaphon after this review. With all that in mind, I give Cthulhu Tech a 7 out of 10.